Solomon declares that he has made a house for God. This is very interesting. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. My name is Rod Ember. And I'm Janice. And this is Bible Discovery TV as we begin to explore the Bible again today, 2 Chronicles chapter 6. It's very interesting. Corey is here. What's up, Corey? We're going to be taking a look at an Egyptian style ancient tomb in Jerusalem. All right, very good. That's interesting. And we'll look for that. What did you do today? We're going to talk about the newness of the temple. All right, good. The newness of the temple. Now, Ryan is also here. Ryan, what's happening? Well, you know, in today's reading, Solomon declares that even the highest heavens can't contain God. Well, to help us grasp the enormous scale of the heavens, we're going to explore some of the supermassive stars that God has made. All right, very good. I love that. You know, God talks to Abraham. He's the first astronomer. I love this. Anyway, all that and more coming your way. Let's open up the Bible and discover. Second Chronicles chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. Then Solomon spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house and a place for you to dwell in forever. Then the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while all the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, who has fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father David, saying, Since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel in which to build a house that my name might be there, nor did I choose any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of my father David to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. But the Lord said to my father David, Whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the temple, but your son, who will come from your body, he shall build the temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word which he spoke, and I have filled the position of my father David and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And I have built the temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. And there I have put the ark in which is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with the children of Israel. Second Chronicles chapter six, verses one through 11. We are in the historical sections of this particular passage of scripture. This is great. Now, listen carefully. God allowed David and Solomon to petition and make changes to God's plan. Now, our human minds can think of all sorts of problems with this idea, (laughs) but God is not threatened. God is so much bigger than we can actually think and comprehend. The truth is, He has always invited us to creatively interact with his creation. And that's, of course, according to Genesis chapter 2, verses 19 to 20. Now, though we might not fully understand it, which I don't, God's gracious will is both accomplished and includes us as individuals. Now, keep in mind that when we confess Christ as our Lord and Savior and we begin to follow him, God gives us the mind of Christ, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 16. Nearly a thousand years before the cross, Solomon speaks to the people of Israel and says that while God dwells in the dark cloud, he, Solomon, is going to make him a temple or a house. Now, the importance of God being in their midst is paramount. In the New Testament times, after the work of Jesus Christ, we are suddenly told by Paul the Apostle that we are the temple of God. Now that's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. That our spirit has been revived and God lives inside of us. God is the one who makes us holy. And we are called to become God's priest 
and to do the things that God desires us to do. Now that is really something. Think that through. We are called to do the things God desires us to do. We're not called to be who we want to be. We're not called to be the people that we've decided to be, but I'm a bond servant. I'm a slave, if you would. A lot of people say, well, slave is a bad thing. Well, in human terms, it is. But when you serve a loving and caring Lord like Jesus Christ, it is not. That's why the disciples said, James and Paul and all of them, Peter, they said we're bond servants of Jesus Christ. Very important to remember. Now get your Bible guide and turn to today's passage as we study this. We're going to be looking at the Lord's will. I remember when I pastored the church, people would come up to me, I just want to know what God's will is. What's God's will? Well, we're going to talk about that today. <laughs> we're going to understand it or begin to understand what God says. Now you can write to us or call us. The best way to get to us is by the stream TV or by Bible Discovery TV. Remember the TV, that's important. BibleDiscoveryTV.com. And let me just say, I want to say this here because it's very important. I want to thank all the people who've given donations. That is so great. It keeps us going, keeps us strong. That's what we live on around here. And so we can come to you every day because of those donations. Thank you so much for that. Praise God. Father, touch the people today and bless them, Lord, in Jesus' name. As we begin in this particular study on the Lord's will, let's pray. Father, I ask in the name of Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, that you would help us to hear what your will is. Help us to understand how you perform your will and how you ask us to involve ourselves in it. Help us to see here as we, we look at what Solomon did and we understand how his mind was working in Jesus' name. And we said together, amen. Now, look at the first passage. This is really interesting. Second Chronicles chapter 6. The Bible here says something interesting. Then Solomon spoke. He said, the Lord said he would dwell in the dark cloud. And I have surely built you an exalted house, Solomon said. He continued, a place for you to dwell in forever. Now, that's interesting because I want to tell you that Solomon declared that he has made a house for God to dwell in. Now that's fascinating, but listen to this. As Christians or Christ followers, we are the house of the Lord to dwell in. We are the house of the Lord to dwell in. Remember that Solomon said this and God was allowing him to do that. And he allowed people to build his house. And we too are individuals, body, soul, and mind. And how we build our house, how we condition ourselves, is not for us, but if we are Christians, we prepare ourselves and condition ourselves for the use of the Lord Jesus Christ. Beloved, that is just the way it is. If we serve the Lord, we are 100% in. We are all sold out for the Lord. Anybody who's not doesn't really understand that they're a house for the temple of God. Now this gets interesting, so let's read on. It says in 2 Chronicles Chapter six, verse three, it says, then the king turned around and blessed the whole assembly of Israel while the assembly of Israel was standing. And he said, blessed be the Lord God of Israel who has fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father, David. Listen carefully. Fulfilled with his hands what he spoke with his mouth to my father David, saying, since the day that I brought my people out of the land of Egypt, I have chosen no city from any tribe of Israel which to build a house, that my name might be there, nor did I choose any man to be a ruler over my people Israel. Yet I have chosen Jerusalem that my name may be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. Now, it was in the heart of my father, David, to build a temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel. This is interesting because the point number two is this. Listen carefully. Solomon reflects on how his father, David, wanted to build a temple for God. David wanted to do that. 
So let's give our praise and glory to God, not to ourselves and others. When somebody builds a big building, we say, who built that? You know, who's the architect? But listen carefully. God creates all the buildings. God creates everything. We need to give glory to God as believers in Jesus Christ. And as Christ, that's what Solomon did. And that's what we need to do. We need to give glory to God all the time. Wherever God has built and wherever he's designed, it is God's doing. Very important. Very important. Now, here we go to the last part, 8 to 11. But the Lord said to my father, David, whereas it was in your heart to build a temple for my name, you did well in that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build a temple, but your son who will come from your body. He shall build a temple for my name. So the Lord has fulfilled his word, which he spoke, and I have fulfilled the position of my father, David, and sit on the throne of Israel as the Lord promised. And as I have built the temple for the name of the Lord God of Israel, and there I have put the ark, the ark of God, in which the covenant of the Lord, that's the Bible, which he, he made with the children of Israel. Now, this brings me to the last point. Listen carefully. God furthered his covenant with humanity. He furthered his covenant with humanity and Israel through the temple. Listen to this very carefully. God finished his covenant through Jesus Christ. God finished his covenant through Jesus Christ. And that's why we today are the temple of the Lord because God did that. And I have asked Jesus Christ into my heart to follow him. And let me encourage you, if you have never done that, you should do that now. Ask him forgiveness of your sin. Ask him into your heart. That is the only way, according to the Bible, that we can make heaven. And God will do it for us if we ask him in Jesus' name. Well, it's time now to carry on with our Bible study. And today we read about Solomon's speech and dedication following the completion of the glorious and long-awaited temple. And I really like what he says in 2 Chronicles chapter 6, verse 18. He says, But will God really dwell on earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple that I have built. Well, Solomon's right. Neither the temple nor the heavens can contain our Lord. Now, while we can comprehend the size of Solomon's temple, we cannot comprehend the massive scale of the universe and the celestial objects therein. And if you don't believe me, then check out some of these supermassive stars that God made. These will demonstrate beyond a shadow of a doubt the absolutely stunning power and scale of God. Let's explore. As astronomers have turned their modern high-tech eyes toward the stars, one of the most startling discoveries has been the extraordinary sizes of these great wonders. Indeed, our Sun, classed as a type G star, is 1.4 million kilometers in diameter. Since the Earth only has a diameter of 12,700 kilometers, this means you could fit 960,000 Earths inside of the Sun. To put it another way, if the Earth were the size of a golf ball, then the Sun would be 15 feet in diameter. This is impressive to say the least, yet our star is just a small speck in comparison to many of the others. For example, the brightest star in our sky, called Sirius, is nearly twice the diameter of the Sun at 2 million kilometers. Even more impressive is the star called Pollux, which is located in the constellation Gemini with a diameter of 11 million kilometers. That is almost 10 of our suns. Larger still, Alnilam, the middle star of Orion's belt, boasts a diameter of 33 million kilometers, or 25 of our suns. 
However, one of the largest stars in our galactic neighborhood is a red supergiant called Betelgeuse. It is roughly 600 times the diameter of the Sun at 1.6 billion kilometers. It is twice the size of Earth's orbit around the Sun, and 262 trillion Earths could fit inside it. In fact, if Betelgeuse were placed at the center of our solar system, it would completely engulf the inner planets. However, possibly the largest star discovered so far is VY Canis Majoris. With a diameter of 2 billion kilometers, 7 quadrillion Earths could fit inside this star. While some believe these incredible stars were simply an accident of nature, others understand that they absolutely reflect an almighty and powerful creator. Indeed, according to the Bible in Psalm 33:6, the Creator breathed out the starry hosts. Something else to consider is this. If the stars that have been discovered thus far are this large, then how immense must their Creator be? Isaiah 40:12 reveals that it was with the breadth of His hand that God marked off the heavens. This is absolutely stunning. Now, please don't misunderstand. By describing God's size compared to the stars, I'm in no way attempting to limit God to the physical dimension. I'm also not denying His omnipotence, omnipresence, or anything else. Today, we explored the largest stars ever discovered, totally unfathomable sizes that we can't even imagine. Then we read Isaiah 40:12, which says, it was with the breath of His hand that God marked off the heavens. The point, of course, is that if we can't even imagine the sizes of these stars, then how are we imagine their creator? God is truly amazing. Corey, what did you study today? Thanks, Ryan. Well, today we are going to be taking a look at a specific tomb in Jerusalem that has in its name a certain tie or connotation to the time period of King Solomon. Over the last couple of shows, you and I have been taking a look at some of the ancient tombs that have been discovered in Jerusalem, but this one is a bit of a tourist attraction all in and of itself. Uh, it's called today the Tomb of Pharaoh's Daughter because some of the Egyptian imagery that is believed to have gone with this tomb. And of course, the tomb of Pharaoh's daughter, uh, linking it to the, the princess of Egypt that King Solomon is said to have married. Today, you and I are going to be focusing in on this ancient place and see what we can learn about both of these connotations. Take a look. In an ancient graveyard in Jerusalem sits an unassuming box-like structure carved out of solid rock. It is popularly called the Tomb of Pharaoh's Daughter, wishing to be associated with the time King Solomon married a princess of Egypt. Archaeological examinations of the tomb have indeed strengthened the tomb's connection with ancient Egypt, but distanced it somewhat from the time of Solomon. Due to some very compelling yet scant remains, it has been demonstrated that the tomb used to have a pyramid structure as its roof. This pyramid was carved away, likely during the area's reuse as a quarry in the 2nd century AD. The outside of the tomb also features a distinct Egyptian-style cornice, the carved area where the walls meet the roof. These characteristics have led to a natural correlation between the style of this tomb and certain ancient Egyptian chapels, which is also why the tomb is believed to have been painted in bright and varying colors, like the chapels it seems to emulate. In the Byzantine time period, Christian monks took up residence in this graveyard and made some changes to the tomb of Pharaoh's daughter. Unfortunately, they made the entrance taller, cutting away all but the edges of an inscription over top of the original door. Only one and a half letters survived on the left side of the doorway, what would have been the end of the inscription. It's believed the inscription was a curse against anyone who would open the tomb. Thanks to this surviving letter and an inscription from a tomb nearby, these graves have been dated to the 8th to 7th centuries BC, during the days of some mighty biblical kings of Judah. Getting more specific than this requires a bit of guesswork, but it is known that during the days of King Hezekiah, the alliance between Judah and Egypt was strengthened as they prepared to face the Assyrian Empire. Egyptian imagery even shows up in the royal symbolism from Hezekiah's day and is spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. So 
so that wraps up that, you know, misunderstanding there with calling it the Tomb of Pharaoh's Daughter. It's really intriguing. Everyone really likes to go and see it because of that. It sounds more mysterious. You know, as soon as you add in some ancient Egyptian lingo, things sound you know, really fun. But in, in my opinion, this tomb is still really fun. It, it probably comes from the time period of Hezekiah, which is such an awesome time uh, in the scriptures to be able to look at and study. So while it's not associated or it shouldn't be truly associated with King Solomon, King Hezekiah is really not that bad of a, of a second place. So <laughs> yeah, that's that's interesting. And let me just say that before we go further, uh, we need to let people know that on the 17th, we're having a special live telecast and it is on, is that a Friday? Yeah, that's a Friday. Friday yes. Night. And we're going to be talking about uh, pandemics, plagues, and panic. Recently, we were involved in the, the world was involved in a, a very panicky type of situation where a virus was going around and taking lives and everybody got scared and went crazy. And I did a special video on that uh, several times things that we did on that. But I think it's important that we discuss this because this will happen again. And uh, we're going to be talking about that live on Friday. And uh, what's the time we're talking about that, Corey? I can't remember off the top of my head, but if you just go to Bible Discovery TV on Facebook or look us up on YouTube, it's going to be a live event on Facebook and YouTube. So if you just go to one of our social media spots, you will find all the info on there. So join us for that special broadcast. It's going to be very interesting and we'll trace out what God mm -hmm. is doing and how come if God is in control of the planet, then what's the deal? How come this happens? God is not in control of viruses. Actually, he is, but we'll talk about that and more on that particular broadcast. Janice? And truthfully, because of how we have to tape these programs, we are right in the midst of, of this right pandemic now. right now. So when we come to that live telecast, we're not exactly sure where this situation is going to be. So it's going to shape up to be a very interesting evening, yes. whether we're still involved in the middle of it or whether we can glean um, life lessons from having gone through it, yeah. knowing how to move forward. I'm so it's not, going to be an interesting, interesting telecast. And I just want to say that I'm not afraid and there's no reason to really be afraid. And uh, people are calling our office. They're upset. They're trying to find out things. Don't be afraid. Jesus Christ said it many times in the Bible. Do not be afraid because God knows exactly what's happening and how it's happening and why. Janice? All right. So in this chapter, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, we hear Solomon's speech upon completion of the work of the temple. And he has a special prayer of dedication for the temple. And it reminded me of this brand newness of the temple that was there. And Solomon uh, talking about it, dedicating it, praying to God about it. And it reminded me of the newness of our life when we dedicate our lives to the Lord Jesus Christ as our savior and as our redeemer. And um, it reminded me as well that if we wander away from God in the same way that there was destruction of the temple, if we walk away from God with our lives, there will come a crumbling, there will come a falling away, there comes a disturbance within our lives and that newness is lost. It's so important for us as followers of Christ to follow him with our lives. In that way, we need to know what he says and we need to obey what he tells us to do. One of the things that we read about in Matthew chapter seven, verses 24 through 28, is to build our life on the foundation of God. Now in this chapter, Jesus had taught on these subjects. Do not judge. He, he taught on keep asking, seeking, knocking. He taught on the narrow way. He taught on you will know them, that's believers and followers of Jesus Christ, by their fruits. Then he speaks on a chapter where he says, I never knew you. Then he goes into, then build on the rock. And I'm going to read it for you. Therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall, for it was founded on the rock. 
But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain descended, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat on that house, and it fell, and great was its fall. And so it was when Jesus had ended these sayings that the people were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. It's like that children's song that we, we used to sing in, in Sunday school and taught you kids about the wise man built his house upon the rock. Mm -hmm. And that rock, of course, is the rock Jesus Christ, the cornerstone. And with that foundation, it is never wavering. It's always the same. Jesus has been the same yesterday, today and forever. Put your life and your trust in and on Jesus Christ. He will give you the peace that you need. He will give you the hope that you need. He is our source for everything, our refuge and our strength and ever present help in the time of trouble. I think that's very important today for us to remember as we uh, do this broadcast. Of course, tomorrow we're doing the live broadcast and it's very important for us to remember whatever happens in the world, that Jesus Christ is stronger than that. Jesus Christ is not subject. Jesus, listen carefully. Jesus Christ is not subject to anything. He understands everything. He created everything. So we need to get that in our souls. We need to get that in our heart and understand if our lives are right with the Lord, then the Lord will make us right. He did not come to punish those who are righteous. But he came, of course, to deal with sin. And that's very important. So we keep that in our heart, keep that in our mind, because God is dealing with us. And I find that to be very, very critical today as we carry on and we look at life around us and what has happened. 